Good morning. My name is um, Patrick Coogan. I am the pastor from the Kaitaia Seventh-day Adventist Church. I've known um, Lynn as a, an associate and friend since the late 80s, and so it has fallen to me, uh, my privilege, to uh, MC this funeral here this morning. Um, I have a request from the church here, and they've asked, please, because there's still a lot of people outside and standing, if it's possible just to move slightly in towards the centre of the pews um, in case we are able to squeeze one or two more seats on the outside. It looks pretty full, but uh, there's also some seats down the front here as well. Thank you. I would like to welcome you all on behalf of uh, the family uh, welcome all the friends that have come from New Zealand and Australia and also those people who will be watching the service at some other time on live stream. So the family, uh, thank you very much for your presence here this morning. Um, it means a lot to them. I was told that Lynn decided to have his funeral here at Mill Road because his parents were instrumental in building this church here originally, and also that um, over the years, a lot of their uh, funerals and weddings have been held here. So Lynn was very pleased to, to have the service um, at Mill Road here. Throughout the service, in fact, at three times throughout the service, there will be a slideshow, and after the slideshow, there will be a pause uh, in case anybody would like to get up and share uh, something about Lynn. Uh, the family have asked that um, could we keep it to uh, a shorter time span as there's probably a lot of people here this morning who would like to say a few words. So after the slide shows, uh, I'll announce that time and there's three times throughout the service where people are able to get up and speak and um, give their best wishes to the family. Also, at the end um, of the service here this morning, uh, we won't be going on to the cemetery or anything, uh, and Lynn has made a special request to end it this way. Um, you'll notice in your program there's a sticky note there somewhere. Have you found that? And that's for the purpose of uh, writing whatever you would like to say to Lynn as a final farewell. If you could write that, please, on that sticky note, and then we'll attach it to the flower, to a flower, which will be put on top of the coffin, and then um, the coffin will be farewelled from the church here. So thank you. I would now like to uh, invite you to stand. We're going to sing our first song of the morning, which is in the sweet by and by. Let's stand together.
I invite you to remain standing now and we'll invite Pastor William Arama to lead us in prayer. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we come at a time there, Father, that a servant that you have called has been called to rest now from his pain, from the sickness, Lord, that he's been struggling with for so long. And we come there, Lord, together to let the family know that they have our support. Also, Father in heaven, we want to acknowledge, Lord, that Lynn, he's been a servant for you, Lord, and for your kingdom. I hear stories of him, their Lord, preaching the gospel, the gospel that sets people free from the bondage of sin. And many, their father, have testified and have acknowledged that Lynn was one that allowed them to see the gospel full and free, to see Jesus full of grace and mercy. And we want to thank you, Lord, for his, for his willingness to be your servant, to lead others to the cross of Calvary. We thank you, dear Father, that, um, Lord, he... He has had that part to play in your service. And I know, their Father in heaven, that there is tears falling in your kingdom at this moment. But we pray now, their Father, for Susanna and the family, Lord, that you'll give them your comfort, that you, their Father, will give them your strength, your peace, The brothers, Lord, is his family. I know that they were close, Lord. And I pray that you'll give them strength as well and your peace. But most of all, Lord, we can share in this great hope, the hope of your soon return, Lord, the hope that the grave does not have the last say, that you, their Father in heaven, that you will call us up one day not to depart from each other again the tears that we share today will be wiped away will be voices of joy because Lord you'll reunite each other again and we want to say thank you so Lord be with us at this time may you give us your peace May your grace abound. May your mercy be with the family, Lord. And may you, their Father in heaven, establish your kingdom today in our hearts that we may meet our brother again. In Jesus' name, amen. I would like to now invite uh, Lynn's beloved daughter, Heaven, who is coming forward to share a testimony with us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm hoping to be able to share with you some of what Samuel Lynn Webber was like as a dad. I'm wearing dad's tie in the hopes I'll gain some of his super speaking powers. <laughs> If I can't get through what I want to say, my friend Jen, who's been here for the last five months helping out with Dad, is going to take over from me. We spent eight years of my childhood in Papua New Guinea. Dad loved it up there. We, init we initially lived at a Seventh-day Adventist college, Sonoma, which was way out in the WAPs, about an hour down a pothole dirt road from Rabaul. Our first Christmas there, I was frantic. I can remember I was just freaking out that Santa wouldn't be able to get his presents to us as our house didn't have a chimney. <laughs> it 
Mum tried to reassure my worries away by leaving the door wide open for Santa to fit his jolly massive frame through. We left cookies out and a glass of milk. I remember glancing back at the door on my way to bed, making sure it was open, and I was hoping and praying that Santa would be okay adapting to a door entry. In the morning, imagine my complete relief when I woke up and found an empty glass, cookie crumbs, and the best part, presents under the tree. Years later, Dad was at the Chathams looking after his beautiful grandson, Jonty, who at the time was attending a kohanga there. It was leading up to the Christmas holidays and they were having a special party to end the year. As Dad was there, they asked if he'd dress up and be the drop-in Santa at the party. Jonty squealed with delight twice. The first time on Santa's arrival and the second time when he caught a glimpse of Santa's face. A couple of years later, Jonty whispered to me, I know who Santa Claus is, he said. Who is he, I asked. To which Jonty replied, Granddad is Santa Claus. <laughs> Jonty was so delighted and proud that he knew who Santa was and that he was, in fact, his granddad. <laughs> Although I giggled about it at the time and thought, isn't Jonty just so cute? <laughs> he was actually spot on. My dad really was a real-life Santa Claus. Dad gained nieces and nephews years before he even had thoughts of a wife. Dad used to pick out presents for all of them, and then on Christmas Eve, he'd throw the presents in through the window and climb in after them. He'd then place them nicely for his special little rallies to find in the morning. Dad was such a great dad, but he was also a pastor and, of course, a sparky. This meant that he was always busy and often away from home, so I always felt ripped off by his absence. But what Dad did give just like Santa, was a very special present, and that was the gift of his complete presence. Santa Claus always brings the present you want to you, wrapped up all colourful and exciting, and with your name written on it. He reminds me so much of my dad. Dad wasn't big and fat, mind you, because although dad always loved food, he never gained weight. <laughs> However, dad had the unique quality of being able to be present with all those he encountered. Always packaged in a wrapping catered to each individual he spent time with. The best of all gifts you can ever receive. These are some of my favourite gifts my special Santa dad gave me. I have a vague memory of assisting my dad with the milking. Dad hand milked three cows in exchange for rent when I was really tiny. The memory I have is of how crucial my assistance was in order for the pail of milk to arrive back at the house without being dropped. In my memory, I was big and strong and carrying almost the entire pail. But when I look at the photos, the pail is leaning over precariously and my poor dad was no doubt going to great lengths to keep the milk in the bucket, while at the same time ensuring I felt incredibly important. That is the first gift my dad gave me, the knowing that I was crucial and incredibly capable. This is one for Carl. <laughs> Dad's unique ability to sensitively connect with anyone and everyone was a quality he was able to use to teach me a much needed lesson. When I was around the age of nine, I went through a stage where nothing caused me more delight than scaring my brother Carl. I'd hide around corners or behind furniture and I'd leap out and yell BOO at the top of my lungs. Carl would dissolve instantly into a blithering, sobbing mess every time. <laughs> my mum told me off, yelled at me, pulled out the wooden spoon, all to no avail. My mum, my, my, I continued my favourite game until my dad stepped in. I always learnt from experience and Dad must have known this with the wonderful gift of intuition that he had. I was lying in bed, about to go to sleep one night. My room had glass louvers all alongside the hallway, and my bed was right next to these louvers. Dad crawled along the hallway until he was right beside my bed, with just the louvers between me and him. And he gave me the biggest fright I've ever received in my life. 
I dissolved instantly into a blithering, sobbing mess. <laughs> my dad rushed into my room, held me in his arms, and he said gently, this is how Carl feels. I never did it again. So the second gift my dad gave me was the gift of empathy, of understanding others and what they're going through. <sighs> the biggest and final gift Dad gave me, I find this one the hardest to say, I think most captures the essence of my dad. I struggled to find words to describe it until I found this quote, written by the former Westminster Dean, Michael Main, in a letter to his grandchildren. If I could have waved a fairy wand at your birth and wished upon you just one gift, it would not have been beauty or riches or a long life. It would have been the gift of wonder. My dad was a great man who taught me the magic of wonder. This is the baton he passed on to me in the wacky relay of life. This precious wonder baton shoots rainbows onto walls, causes water bottles to glitter and glow, and creates fairy tales around windmills and engines. Dad shared the wonder of air streaming around an aeroplane wing, the magical cloud castles in the sky, soft like white marshmallows shining with light that I could bounce on like Neil Armstrong walking weightless on the moon. The wonder as raindrops fell against the windscreen and slowly join other raindrops until they form a huge pool of water at the bottom. Dad would hug a tree and feel its rough, nurturing skin rubbing against him. What a beautiful old fella, Dad would whisper as he connected in a way only the King of Wonder could. The wonder as morning dew glistens on a spider's home, spun with architectural genius from their busy bums overnight. Wonder everywhere, stars, mushrooms, and for you two, especially tomatoes. <laughs> Limitless wonder, the magic of it all. Dad would hold a half-filled water bottle right up to his eye and get lost in the wonder of how the water flowed inside. He'd peer in from all angles, slowly rocking it with his hand. The wonder as he pulled a toaster or radio apart and explored the inner workings of the true magic that man has created. He'd talk to me in quiet awe of capacitors, resistors, and red, green, and black wires of stored energy and electrons. A very important baton that came from an exceptional man who taught me the magic of wonder. I know Dad shared many things with many people, but to me, he will always be the wizard who passed on the baton of wonder. In his final months, when he was wracked with pain, I so often wish Santa would appear with a special final gift that would make Dad pain-free and bring back his wonder. I think my wish has now come true. Goodbye to the wonder wizard, one very special, amazing Dad. This is his beautiful grandson, Jonty. Well, hello. I am obviously uh, my granddad's grandson, <laughs> and I I have so many memories of my granddad. One of them was when we were cutting the Christmas tree down. I uh, he would put I would put, go on his shoulders and try to cut it down, <laughs> and he, and he would get sick of it, so we would just cut it down anyway. <laughs> And another time I had with him is when he was telling me all his stories. Some of them were actually very funny. For example, one of them, uh, his brother, <laughs> uh, lit, was saying, oh, I have a secret tunnel. Oh, do you want to go see my secret tunnel? My granddad said, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Then his brother said, 
he said, oh, I need to get a blindfold on you. So he led him all around where the cows were and he was standing in this soggy little stuff and he was going, oh man, what is this? He opened his eyes and he was standing in cow poo. <laughs> After that, his brother got a real big hiding. <laughs> this, is th this time is when his brother and him were doing something naughty. Uh, they were selling golf balls for 10 cents each. And he had a lawnmower, electricity kink. kink going to the lawnmower and when he and uh he, when he would go room room to the lawnmower uh the electrical the the golf balls would get electrocuted <laughs> so when people the golf ball when a person came up saying oh hello how much would be that golf that the ghost golf balls be oh they'll they'll be they'll say oh that would be our turn soon then they got the golf ball and unfortunately they got electrocuted. The reaction wasn't like this. Oh yeah, I got electrocuted, that's just it. The reaction was like <laughs> So, uh, how would you like it if somebody did a trick on you if you got electrocuted? Well, I taught my granddad many things. He taught me many things. <laughs> Uh, but the main moral of this is you're never too old to learn. Good morning, everybody. I've been asked to share a couple of messages with you from the family. First one is from our sister, Alvia. She's the eldest of the Weber clan, and she lives in Perth. Unfortunately, she can't be here with us today, as her husband, Kevin, is very ill. But we know, Alvia, you're here with us in spirit. These are Alvia's words. A big hello to all my friends and wonderful family in New Zealand. I am writing to you on this very sad occasion to say how sorry we are that we are unable to be here with you all today. We are so grieved at the tragic loss of our dear brother who has gone far too soon. What a man he was. I was so proud to claim him as my brother. Lynn was one that if anyone wanted a helping hand, he was there for them. He certainly lived out his values as a real dinky die Christian. We just loved him to bits. The fun times we had together, both in New Zealand and Australia, my mind goes back to the times we had on the piano, playing duets together. I also remember the day, for some reason, my mother thought he had done something wrong. So warned Lynn that when Dad got home, he was asked to deal with him. How this came about, I have no idea. As we all know, Lynn was always the one who did no wrong. <laughs> When Dad arrived home, he was asked to chastise him. After finding out what it was Lynn had done, Dad took him into the bedroom, closed the door, and you could hear him with the razor strap supposedly smacking him. However, he was hitting the arm of the chair, telling Lynn to yell like he was getting hit. <laughs> Next thing, Mum is at the door yelling out, Carl, that's enough, that's enough. <laughs> So Carl stopped. Lynn was told to go and wash his face and not to do it again. <laughs> mm, so much for not telling little porkies, eh? <laughs> we were broken hearted when the decision was made to go back home to New Zealand from Perth. Our loss, your gain. Lynn, my darling brother, may you ever rest in peace in the arms of Jesus. We will meet again one day, somewhere down the way. Your loving sister, Alvia and Kevin. And the second message is on behalf of my husband, Raymond. He doesn't feel in a good enough state to be able to do this. Raymond is the youngest 
of the clan, hence the nickname Bubby. Lynn was the next one in line, so he was a patient go-to brother for Raymond when he needed advice and someone to confide in and trust. An example of this was one day in his teenage years, Raymond was home alone, having a quiet smoke <laughs> in the family lounge of all places. <laughs> he didn't think that one through very well. <laughs> Lynn came home unexpectedly and caught him, gave him a big growling, then promised Raymond he wouldn't tell his parents because he would have been huge trouble as long as he never smoked again. The deal was done. Lynn kept his word and never mentioned it and Raymond never touched a cigarette again. <laughs> that was the sort of guy he was, considerate, kind and a man of his word. As our spiritual leader, he inspired us with his wonderful knowledge and understanding of scripture, especially the gospel message, which, he, which was central to how he lived his life. He would often call in for a cuppa or with some Maccas while on his visitation, either in his caring role or doing all sorts of electric, electrical jobs for people. During this last year, he would occasionally say, I feel so tired, I just don't know why. And we would tell him, just go home, Lynn, and put your feet up. But he would say, I've promised to visit someone. So he would press on, because that was who he was. And he would never have it any other way. Well, Lynn, who are Bevan and Raymond going to argue politics with now? <laughs> The bros would call each other nearly every day. Paul Lynn was outnumbered, but he was stubborn and stood his ground, and it was all in good spirits. When Lynn and Sue would visit, the conversation more than often swung around to politics. Sue and I would look at each other, roll our eyes, go into the other room and leave them to it. <laughs> so on behalf of Alvia and Kevin, Bevan and Marilyn, Max and Glennis, Raymond and myself, we would like to say thank you, Lynn, for being such an awesome brother. We will miss you very much, but we know that this is just the intermission part of life. The second half will be perfect forever. The best is yet to come, and we'll see you then. I'd just like to now ask um, Peter Pullman to come forward, Susanna's brother, who's going to share a eulogy with us. Thank you. Folk, as I look at you all here, I sort of feel as I'm, I'm at a uh, family reunion and we've got another big one coming one of these days. Samuel Lynn Webber died peacefully in his sleep in the early hours of Monday morning, March 26. He had been a church pastor since 1974, but that wasn't his original area of expertise. He was a qualified electrician first, spending several months of his five-year apprenticeship installing lights on the Wongaray Base Hospital. Later on, during, after his apprenticeship, he also spent quite a bit of time working for Otis with all their complicated uh, circuitry. His electrical knowledge was a great asset. He was able to earn his college fees working part-time as a sparky at the Sanitarium Health Food Company while he was studying for his theology degree in Australia. 
A few years later, when he was teaching and mentoring ministers in Papua, Papua New Guinea, his ability to repair damaged wiring and keep generators humming was greatly appreciated. Back in Kiwin land for 10 years, we had two in Hamilton, then eight in Northland. Even though he subsequently cared for all church members north from pa from part of Wangarei to Kaitai, he usually carried his toolbox in the boot of his car and was often asked to tweak a fuse or check a faulty connection. We restored an old house during that time. One day a week he was doing anything from digging ditches to balancing very unsafely on high ladders, re rewiring the house painting and wallpapering. He could turn his hand to anything, a very hard worker. Soon after the house restoration was completed, about eight years later, we were asked to go back to Australia and care for one of the largest congregations in Melbourne. This was another interesting challenge, but he was greatly appreciated by the members when they got to know him. He visited everyone regularly and went out of his way to assist with both personal and spiritual struggles. Five years later, when we transferred to Perth, he had the same bond with his congregations. We officially retired 2005, but that, do but that did not stop his God-given desire to minister. Whether this was in a practical way the toolbox in the boot, or personal needs. Judging from the emails we have been receiving from around Kiwiland and across the Tasman Sea, he was greatly appreciated by many. As I have mentioned, his electrical skills have enabled him to be extremely useful, but unfortunately, those months in hospital... Sorry. I'll just start this one again. As I have mentioned, his electrical skills have enabled him to be extremely useful, but unfortunately, these months on the hospital job back in the 60s, when he was drilling holes in the ceilings through asbestos, uh, it, the reason he fell victim to its harmful effects last year. We have had a great life together seen quite a bit of the world, and I know he will be missed by many more than myself, our children and extended family. As he said a couple of weeks ago, his condition was bearable, because we know there is a heaven that is not too far away. How special to have the blessed hope, and his close, see you again soon, Sam. Could we have our second slideshow now? And um, at the f end of this slideshow is the opportunity to uh, invite people here in the audience who would like to share a few words with us today to come forward. Uh, despite what I said about there being three occasions, there will only be this occasion after the slideshow. So uh, we look forward to you sharing then. Thank you. While we're um, at the end of the slideshow, we'll sing our song, which is He Touched Me, also a favourite of mine. Thank you. All right, let's stand together now and we'll sing this wonderful song, Shackled by a Heavy Burden. Thank you. 
Please be seated. We now invite you to come forward and um, share your thoughts and recollections of Lynn. And while the first person is thinking about that, I would just like to um, offer our, the thoughts and feelings of the Kaitaia Seventh-day Adventist Church, where Lynn uh, ministered for a, a good number of years and had a very successful ministry in Kaitaia. And I know that the people there would want me to convey our very best wishes to Susanna and the rest of the family. And uh, thank you very much for the time that um, Lynn was with us. And even over recent years, I managed to get him as often as he would come and preach uh, with us. So uh, Lynn will be sorely missed by us in Kaitaia. I'd just like to invite now anyone who would like to come forward and share their thoughts or recollections. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Cherie Leggett, and um, I want to pay tribute to our much-loved Pastor Lynn from the Tikipanga Adventist Fellowship. It has been a privilege for my husband Alan and myself to have been joint leaders with Lynn for our Tikipanga Fellowship for the past possibly eight or ten years. I'm not sure how long you've been in Mongaray. Lynn was, uh, well, back in New Zealand, really, yes. Lynn was amazing to work with. He threw himself into every endeavour with enthusiasm and passion. He was dedicated to the salvation of souls, and he was totally committed to his calling. It was obvious throughout his life. Any suggestions that were presented to him, we would discuss, and he would usually go along with them. If he disagreed, he always had a legitimate reason. When counselling was needed uh, in our church family or, or outside the church family, he was gentle, compassionate, patient and kind, always open to hear the other side of the story. He once said, we have two ears for listening and only one mouth for speaking. I remember him at the Kaikoui church when our kids were lively teenagers. It's hard to believe they're in their 40s now. Lynn would get involved in their games and just be a kid with them. He loved the action and the bravado. I recall one night when he was playing Capture the Flag in Loopy's Orchard in Kerry Kerry. It was pitch black, no moon, and we couldn't see the stars. And they were playing Capture the Flag. <laughs> couldn't even see the orchard trees. Uh, Lynn and my daughter Melanie were in the same team. They were both heading for the opposition's flag, but they were coming from opposite angles. So intent were they on capturing the, the flag that they couldn't, didn't see each other. They collided. <laughs> both gasped because they nearly winded, because <laughs> they were running. And um, then they got a fit of the giggles once they'd got their breath back, and of course it revealed their whereabouts. So of course they didn't capture the flag. But Lynn always loved fun, laughter, family and friends. He was a great minister for visiting. And that's so appreciated, especially, uh, appreciated, especially amongst our, our older folk. Um, Lynn and Susanna were thoughtful and caring people. I recall one of our young families that are here today. The mother had just come, uh, come home from delivering her third infant in less than three years. The day she arrived home with her newest infant, Lynn arrived at the door with a huge box of groceries, frozen fresh and canned. She was overwhelmed. Lynn and Sue Anna always noticed where there was a need. Lynn, following his retirement, kept his hand at practical electrical things, as you've heard about, for friends, neighbours, anybody. And um, I remember one Sabbath, one of our darling uh, ladies, recently widowed, uh, sent out an SOS call to, to Lynn and she said a freezer was not working and possibly been, had been off for several days. Yes, he had it sorted before church. We visited Lynn about three Sabbaths before his death. We discussed several things. He was positive that theology could not save us, that it was only through our faith and trust in Jesus that we have salvation. He accepted God's will for his life and assured us of his readiness to go to sleep in the sure hope of eternity with our Saviour. His sermons in latter years were always focused on Jesus. 
We want to meet with Lynn on that resurrection morning. Lynn longed to meet us when Jesus comes. It is up to us individually to make our calling and election sure. I'd like to uh, share a poem about Samuel. Samuel, a man of sweet essence, you have touched many with your heart. You've gifted the world with your presence and left your indelible mark. I knew you just for a short while as heaven's hero and dear dad. With warm eyes and a special smile, for her you came Superman clad. To Carl you were mentor mentor and guide. Your love for Susanna was true. Being a brother filled you with pride. There's nothing you wouldn't do. There is a boy, it must be noted, whose bond with you can't be broken. Your grandson on whom you doted before his first words were spoken. True gentleman and fine preacher, faithful friend and timely teacher, kind gentleman and heart richer, lover of all life and all creatures. Samuel, your wisdom and insight, bestowed with humble affection, gave many a path filled with light to show them the right direction. It seems to me you lived your life with integrity and true zest, assisting those who were in strife and giving your absolute best. I saw the small boy in the man, cap wearer and one of the lads. Underneath Samuel was just Sam, in touch with his sad and his glad. Your mischievous side was revealed with a bro devised deception golf ball gifts with wiring concealed, giving a shocking reception. Sam took pleasure in simple things like watching a boat on the bay, marvelling at seagulls' wings, listening in a sensitive way. Lover of planes like the Spitfire, a real adventurer at heart, a mind that was born to inspire, a peacemaker right from the start. So here's to the boy and the man. No one can ever take your place. Now you're in God's loving hands. Samuel, sweet of face, full of grace. Thank you. Yeah, Jim Pram, uh, Lynn's cousin, and uh, I beat him onto the planet by about three months <laughs> and uh, 11 months behind his, his, his other brother. Um, condolences to the family and uh, just going to go over a few things because as I say I can remember way back there I can remember when the day they came to church at Raymond and they announced that you'd been born <laughs> well we were pretty close back there weren't we and uh, my mum loved her nieces and nephews and uh, since you were the only ones of our cousins in Wongray at the time. Christmas wasn't Christmas without you guys at home. And uh, Mum looked forward to you having you out there, and I know you, we all look forward to you. And, then, and they weren't the only visits either. In fact, my, our mother reckoned we could smell you guys coming <laughs> because we would, get, we would start getting agitated and ready for you before you even arrived. So I don't know, it might have been the old Morris coming along the, the road there, but um, we, we, we knew. And, and one of the other things I remember was that old dray. We'd just got a tractor and we didn't need the old dray anymore, so it, it sort of went out to the back part of the farm and uh, down onto the clay flats, and uh, we, we found it a, quite a good toy, actually. And uh, we'd struggle it through the tea tree and over a ditch, and we would pull the shaft one way, block the wheel, and pull it the other way, block the wheel, until we got it up the hill, and then we'd turn it, we didn't have to turn it around, we'd just face it downhill, and aim it at the tea tree, and give it a good darn push, and, up, and we'd jump on board, and go for the ride, and it would, 
we couldn't get that big tea tree down there, but we could get the little tea tree, so we'd extract it from the tea tree another time, and the last time it did hit the big tree, and it, we couldn't get it off. So that, that's where it ended up. And uh, yeah, as far as church goes, your dad was a great man in the church and did a lot of things, and we loved the church picnics those days. Um, and getting back to Lynn, he was a peacemaker. I, I was 15 and 16 when this guy would walk into a situation and if we were getting over exuberant, he would calm us down. Or if there was a bit of a squirmish coming up, he'd settle it down. And I read something in Ecclesiastes this morning and it says, calmness can lay great errors to rest. And man, I thought that fits Lynn. And it did too. Anyway, um, <clears throat> the family, including myself and your sister Jill, went over to Te Kaupu at Lilac Villa, the home of Nettie and G Guthrie and her family, and we stayed the weekend. Well, it was a two-storied old nurse's home, and boys went in one room upstairs and the girls went in the other room upstairs, and we'd get called, called at night and a bit of whispering going out the window and to the other window, we'd stick our heads out and smack a cup full of water in the face. <laughs> so we thought, well, we're not going to get done. So we'd get some water and we'd use it. And then to get the water, we had to go downstairs. So we had to go and replenish our stores quite a bit of time. The first time we did, Uncle Carl heard the, the racket going on and he, he uh, followed us into our room and we could hear him coming. Lynn shot to his knees. Max and I got into bed before he got there. And so he came in and he said, well, you know, you better settle down and behave yourselves. And we said, oh, well, I don't know whether we've said anything. We just kept quiet. And uh, so this thing continued again. And uh, we um, had to go down and get another lot of water. And Uncle Carl came in again here in the, here in the, and he and he saw Lynn on his knees again. <laughs> and uh, so I just, want to, I just want to say that Lynn found it a safe place to be on his knees. <laughs> All the best. What I wanted to say goes back to the 1940s. Uh, my husband and I joined the, the church at that time. It was a smaller church down in Norfolk Street. And one of the first couples to come and welcome us there that day was Carl and Bessie Weber. And so uh, that, we've been friend, had been friends until they passed on. And uh, our, my, our family and their family grew up together here in the church. Uh, when Lynn went over to Australia on one of his trips, I don't know which one it was, my eldest son travelled over with him. And when they got to Sydney, they had nowhere to go. And so they got on the train and travelled round and round <laughs> Sydney for the night. <laughs> and uh, Lynn just mentioned that to me not very long ago. And... Uh, one of my son-in-laws a, was a pilot, and he took Lynn up in a plane. I think the girl spoke before, said, mentioned something about the wings past the plane, how he enjoyed the wings. But he did not enjoy this, in fly, this flight because Ben did aerobatics. <laughs> and poor Lynn did not like that. And when uh, Ben was just up the other day, or a few weeks ago, and he mentioned about taking Lynn up. <coughs> in that flight. So we have some very fond memories of the Weber family, growing up with our family and the other families in the church. There were a lot of young people in the church at that time. And Lynn was a sort of a, a leader. People looked up to him, you know, he had the right attitudes. And uh, I'd just like to give my condolences to the family. I don't know who's who. And uh, I'd like to just give my condolences to all the family concerned. Thank you. Hi, I was hoping my older brother would come up and do this, or Wayne, who's the oldest nephew, but no, it's left to me. I just want to say 
Thank you, Uncle Lynn, for jumping in the window, giving us those Christmas presents. We really, really appreciate it. On behalf of um, Julianne, who I know is watching this in Australia, Laurel and Sharon, um, other nieces that couldn't come, um, he was a really special uncle, and we've been talking a lot lately. And I think us with the nieces and nephews are lucky to have such great parents. He's kept us all us cousins together. We love each other very much, and we're a very tight family, and we're going to miss Uncle Lynn because he was really special, and I'll miss his deep conversations. We used to always bring him out to our exchange students and say, tell him that evolution is wrong and that creation is right, and we had some beautiful, beautiful conversations, and I just want to say, we love you, Uncle Lynn. We're proud to call you our uncle, and we're going to miss you, but we will see you again. I guess there's a lot of people here who would have shared a cup of tea with Lynn. Is that right? Yeah. In our younger days, we believed that tea was not good for you, so we never drank it. Anyhow, I can always remember the day when Lynn started work with Garnet Keane Limited. I was an apprentice as well, a year ahead of him. And he came through the door and Garnet Keane introduced us all. <coughs> 10 o'clock came morning tea time. He noticed I had a cup of tea. So he had one as well. <laughs> and from then, he's always blamed me for <laughs> teaching him to drink tea. <laughs> um, I'm not very good at this type of thing, but I have a few words. Um, when Sue and Lynn would come visit me in Perth, they were um, my favourite childhood memories and I will always cherish them. Lynn was a very special man and Sue, you're pretty awesome as well. And um, yeah, us Webbers are a tough bunch, so chin up guys, love you all and thank you everyone for coming. Morning, Sue, my condolences. Um, my name's Ken Wrighton, and I'm bringing a message from my brother-in-law and sister from Australia, Eric and Joy Kingdom. Um, I think Eric was a pastor here for a period of time, and you shared... Yes, that's correct. Um, they share their condolences, and they're thinking of you today. I was a bit blown away. Um, I got a ring at 8.30 New Zealand time from my sister to say that she had heard that Lynn had passed away four o'clock that morning. So the old time frame fingers, I was just blown away by the speed of the travel. Um, Lynn and I have got two things in common. Uh, one, we're both Sparkies. And secondly, um, we both share a little bit of history in the if they had been as church, as in our great great great, great grandfather uh, was the first New Zealander, so, sorry, the first Adventist to New Zealand. So and I think that's a point uh, like to remember today, uh, based on the fact that um, he had uh, Lynn had a very very keen serving this for the church. Thank you. I've just got dragged up to the front. This is one of my. We went did our nursing training in Sydney together, and we had a con, we had an, a connection before we even got to Australia. I came from Fiji, and unbeknownst to myself at the time, Susanna and I were. We had a pen friend in America, and we, in those days it was the um, youth instructor. They always had pages there where you could write to people and, and have them as pen pals. And that's what we both did, yes. didn't we? Yes. And we got to, um, I got to Clyde to, to the nursing classes, and our first day there, I got this um, ball of activity coming out of the nursing home. <laughs> and she man. said, are you Yvonne from Fiji? Sally told me about you. And I said, well, Sally told me about you too. <laughs> 
and um, we've had a very, very good friendship. She's one of my best friends. I was bridesmaid at their wedding, one of the bridesmaids, and um, we've always stayed connected um, over the years. And uh, watching Susanna and Lynn's um, courtship from college to the San, we had some laughs about the time they got uh, locked in or uh, locked in a bob bobbin head. That was their excuse. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> The gates were closed and our car was in there and we had to wait and somebody came and got me and we said, oh yes, we've heard it all, we've heard it all. <laughs> but it's, yes, it's those things that have sort of kept us very, very strong and very, very close. And um, uh, I was fortunate to talk to Padre. Um, she used to call him Padre. I always called him Padre. Mm. Um, uh, probably about three weeks ago. And I was so pleased that he was, I didn't realise at the time because I was talking to Susanna and... Um, she said, um, we were saying, going to say goodbye, and she said, do you want to talk to Lynn? I said, oh, it's Padre out. She said, he's out on the, out on the veranda, out on the porch, sitting out watching the, uh, watching the harbour and um, looking at the, at the sea and that. She said, that's one of his favourite areas. And, um, yeah, I, he, he was very special to me too, and I, I really appreciate it. I mean, it's a big job taking this bundle on. That's, that's, any, <laughs> that's any challenge to anyone. And... Um, how, she, how he kept up with it, I have no idea. <laughs> I give praise to Lynn for so much and for keeping her in tow and keeping her in, 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 doing all the right things and being able to talk up when you... When you she, I mean, this, this is a person I've never met anybody who can add lib or who can just, you know, not looking down at, at, a, at a speech or anything. It just comes flowing out of the mouth. I have no idea. And I, I, I do feel very much in awe of her and I do love her very much. And I remember the two... The, twi the two children too, when they were babies, going up to college with Haley there and changing nappies in their, <laughs> their face. And look at them now, they've turned out beautiful young people. Mm. Oh, thank you. Yeah, what she was saying was we're both writing to the same uh, pen friend in America and when I said I was going to Sydney to do my nursing and she told her as well, they told us to look out for each other and we've been looking out ever have, since, haven't we? we? Have. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Gary, Gary Harwood, uh, one of the leadership team up at Kai Tire Church. Um, I, I'm glad, I, this morning I got up early to come down with some of our mates from Kai Tire and I wrote this text down because he, uh, uh, Samuel as I called him, Samuel one day I rang him up um, after he, we had eight beautiful years, eight beautiful years of Susanna and, and uh, Samuel up there in Kai Tire and we bless him for that because it was a tough time in those days, he had to see his way through some pretty hard-nosed people. But those times, those times were uh, wonderful and, and still affect us in a wonderful way today as, as we're now moving forward again. But one time, I, had a, I, I always rang him up when I needed a sermon. I re, I'd ring him up after he left. I'd ring him up and say, hey, man, I've got this whole mob of Spanish people coming and, and I, need, I need a word. I need a word, you know, and... Uh, and he said, yeah, I've got it. And he was really excited. He was so, yeah, he gets excited. He was excited. And I want to share this with you and with him because it's now coming back to him. And it was beautiful. And, and I, I got the Spanish translation of this word. Um, and I made the Pakeha people in the audience say the Spanish word and the, and the Spanish people say this word. And here it is and you'll get the word. It, this is out of Colossians. We love Colossians chapter 3. I'm only going to read one verse. It says, For you died, and your life is now, anybody know it? Hidden, hidden with Christ in God. I thought, what a beautiful thing, and I've never forgot that, and the Spanish people loved it. And uh, I wanted to say it today that now we know his life is hidden in Christ. Susanna's starting to look at me and um, suggest we do the special item, but um, this time won't come round again, and I just want to give a, a, a final opportunity. If there's something quick you would like to add at this time, please come forward now. Okay, thank you, all those people who've shared. It helps us build up a picture of um, all that Lynn meant to us 
um, over the years. I would now like to ask um, Neil and Jenny to come forward with their special item. Thank you. Before Jenny and I uh, sing our item this morning, a couple of Sabbaths ago, we um, Nettie and I visited uh, Lynn, and um, we managed to find the quiet time, just him and I. And I said uh, to Lynn, um, "How are you, Lynn?" And he looked at me and he said, uh, "You know what, Neil? I'm at peace." Um, then he went on to say, it is well with my soul. Hey, Lynn, that's a line from a hymn. And he said, yeah, it's one of my favorites. Um, that's a very treasured memory for me. And uh, we'll, we'll sing that for you now. <coughs> Like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot Thou hast taught me to say It is well, it is well With my soul It is well it is Oh, 
shall descend even so it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul with my soul Thank you. If I could share a very short refle uh, reflection myself or recollection, um, I remember in the early 90s going to ministers' meetings uh, that were held regularly, and whenever you saw Lynn Webber, or often when you saw Lynn Webber, he was with his good friend in ministry, uh, Pastor Richie Way, and um, they were obviously great colleagues and friends together. And so it is my privilege now to invite Pastor Richie Way to share the pulpit with us this morning. Thank you, Richie. The first time... I met Lynn was when I was sent from the Papua New Guinea Union Mission Office to Sonoma to ordain him into the gospel ministry. And from that particular point, we both became Christian brothers because we both had a real had a growing interest in the gospel. I was a real legalist, absolute. Ask my daughter. Absolute legalist. I don't know about Lynn, but from that time, not just because he was a qualified electrician and I was a qualified engineer, but because we both had this interest in the gospel that we started to grow in grace together in our understanding of the gospel. We kept in contact with each other. <laughs> and I'd say, hey, Lynn, what about this? What about this? We're not saved because we belong to a denomination. We are saved because we belong to Christ. We're not lost because we leave a denomination. We are lost because we leave Jesus, turn our backs on him. <clears throat> and he would come back with something else. And we grew and we grew and we grew. <clears throat> I said... What happened when Jesus died on the cross? When Jesus died on the cross, he was fulfilling a decision that he'd made in the Garden of Gethsemane. He really sweated over that. Why would he sweat over something if he's only going to remain in the grave for three days, come to life again? Sweat blood. It's because when he knew, he knew when he went to the cross, this was it. He would take all our sin upon us 
And because God hated sin so much, he and sin could not exist in the same place, so he turned his back on Jesus and walked away. And when God walked away, life walked, went away from Jesus. And Jesus died the death that every sinner who does not accept him as their saviour will die. A godless, Christ-forsaken, anguished, painful death. And Jesus died that death for you and me so we wouldn't have to. When he died that death, he took all our anger, all our hatred, everything, buried it in the grave. Well, Lynn and I were called to go to Russia together. After the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, the Soviet Union opened up and the people were spiritually hungry and they wanted evangelists from the West to come into Russia to fill the gap that communism had left in their lives. They were empty inside. And uh, the first meeting we had was rather a bit knee-shaking because we were asked to go to a hospital and all the doctors at this hospital wanted us to tell them about Jesus. Can you believe the, that opportunity? What do you say? What do you say? Well, we said to them, the experience that you have of emptiness inside is because the space that's inside you is a God-shaped space in your heart, and only God can fill that. People try to fill it with all sorts of things, drugs, alcohol, cars, sex, you name it. But none of them satisfy. The only thing that will satisfy is for Jesus to come into your life. And you have to accept Jesus. If you accept Jesus, just close your eyes, lift your hand as far as your head. Indicate. And that's what they did. It was a very moving experience for us. There is a text that goes with this. He who has the Son of God has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. And finally, in the honour of Lynn, I'd like to ask, do you have Jesus in your heart? Do you? Something just to ask yourself to pray about at home. Jesus longs to come into our hearts desperately to give you life. He longs for it. Get down on your knees beside your bed if you don't have Jesus in your heart and say, Lord Jesus, please, I want you to come into my life to give me satisfaction, hope, peace and love. Amen. I invite you to stand now as we sing our final hymn this morning. What a day that will be. Let's sing together.
what a day that will be, that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face, one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and he leads me from his land. What a day! Please be seated. We're very fortunate um, today that we're going to leave the last word this morning to uh, Pastor Samuel Lynn Weber. Um, fortunately, when he was leaving Warburton, Australia, and he preached his last sermon there, they made a video clip of this. And Lynn apparently had dug this out and was watching it with Heaven, his daughter. And when it got to this final bit, he said, um, this says what I want to say about ministry. And this just sums things up. So we're going to listen to that in one moment. But just before we do that, I'd like to explain the last part of the service uh, when this video clip is finished, we want Lynn to have the last word, so that will be the close of the service. I would like the pool bearers to come forward. They will then take the coffin out to the hearse, and you will find, um, a as you exit, you'll find flowers out in the foyer. And so you get your sticky note, which we hope you've been able to fill in. You pick up a flower, attach the sticky note to the flower, and you can go up in your own time and just place that um, sticky note and flower on the coffin. So now we're going to hear, um, sadly, very sadly, for possibly the last time, from Pastor Samuel Weber. Thank you. you now I've just got to tell you one more story before we finish. And it was that story I told you about the boys being stuck in the lift, do you remember? And because sometimes we can get so busy that we neglect that which is important. I remember these two boys, I was working on top of the lift in a high-rise building. And I was sitting down just, just musing, just waiting, and the roof was going up and down, you know, people were using it. And it went down to the ground floor, and two little boys came in, about seven years of age. Some of you remember that story, I'm sure. Two little boys came in, and they, um, they looked at each other, and they said, we're not afraid of this, are we? And I said, nah, we're not afraid. So he pushed the top button. Up they went, shoo, right at the top. I said, like, I wonder what they'll do when they get there. And they pushed the, got the top and they pushed the down button. Right down to the bottom again, right down to the bottom. They're going up and down, having a marvellous time, cackling and laughing and enjoying this immensely. I said, oh, I'll fix them. <laughs> so on their, on their journey down, because you can control it from up top there, you see, in a limited way, and on their journey down, because they travel quite fast, on their journey down, I suddenly threw the emergency stop button and switched the lights off. And it was suddenly darkness and just <coughs> to a halt. There was just silence. Not a sound. And then after about what seemed like an eternity, I want my mommy! You know, that one? <laughs> that was this great scream. I felt so sorry for them. I flicked the switches back on and when it got down to the ground floor, you'd never seen two little boys run so fast in all their life. They were gone. Friends, sometimes in life, our lifts stop too and the lights go out. I think of Jackie, Jackie's mum, not the Jackie here. <laughs> Another Jackie. Her mum was a, a lecturer at the school in science, the university in science. She had cancer and she asked me to come and see her because her daughter was going with my nephew and she knew that I was a minister and she asked me to come and see her. When I went in to see her, she only had a few days to live. I remember she, she reached out her hand and she said, I need God. And I don't know how to find him. For her, you see, her lights had gone out and the lift had stopped. And she needed that help. And friends, in all of our lives, we come to that experience sometimes. And that's where you know, this word of God and those, those four absolutes, I believe, can take us through anything. The gospel, salvation in Jesus Christ alone then the Holy Spirit helps us to live for him and base our faith upon the word of God and that alone.
and the hope of Jesus soon coming. Those are my absolutes for the church. I long for a church that passes no moral judgment on anyone. No moral judgment on anyone. Friends, I've learned to be very careful in passing spiritual or judging the spirituality of other people. We should never do that. I long for a church where people are more important than the theological arguments that we sometimes argue. You remember in Matthew chapter 25, the sheep and the goats? Jesus never said to the sheep, come into my kingdom because you believed in the sanctuary doctrine. Come into my kingdom because you've got the 2,300 days all sorted out and you clearly understand the prophetic word of God. Come into my kingdom because you've got the book of Hebrews all sorted out. He never said that. He said, come into my kingdom because I was naked and you clothed me. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was naked and you cared for me. What a testament. That's the kind of church I want. I want a church that practices the gift of 1 Corinthians 13, agape love. Remember it says here, if you have all the prophecies and you can understand all the theology, if you don't have love, nothing. You remember what Philip Yancey said, and I love those words, and they, they bored into my heart so deeply, and, and I, just, I just feel so annoyed when I heard him say that, because I thought, why didn't I think of that? You know, Some people can put things so beautifully and just sum up what you're thinking, can't they? Where he said that we as the Christian church are to be the dispensers of God's grace. Do you love that? Like the fragrance of a flower. Wow. Just imagine if we had to have a church like that, we are the dispensers of God's grace. Showing that love, toleration, and understanding. That's the big rocks. You know, I remember there was a professor. He was the one that initiated the Willow Creek Church. Remember um, Hybels, Bill Hybels? at Willow Creek Church. It was this professor who had initiated it and they were having their uh, a big reunion and all the, all the members who had come to know Jesus through the Willow Creek Church were there and there was about 20,000 people in this huge arena. And the official photographer went to take a, a picture of the, of the big crowd and just as he was taking his picture, a person in the, in the audience or the congregation flashed a little home camera and they were perfectly synchronised, the two cameras. And when he developed his film, he was shocked to see because there in this big film that he had taken was just a big blur. But right in the centre of the blur was the face of this old professor who had initiated the whole program. And tears of joy were just rolling down his face. And he just stood out amongst all the others. It was a freak shock. When I read that story, I thought, you know, that's a bit like it was, and I tried to symbolise the, the gathering of God's people, you know, and, and there with the, imagine the two, two photographs synchronised together. There in the midst of the throng will be the face of Jesus with, with tears rolling down his face, and he says, yeah, it was worth it all. It was worth it all. May God bless you, and we look forward to fellowshipping with you this afternoon.